If you're ready to experience more peace and joy in your life, if you want to feel more comfortable in your own skin, and if you're ready to discover and expand on your energetic gifts and personal power, you're in the right place. So here's your host, Kelly Sparta. Welcome back to Spirit Guides. I'm your host, Kelly Sparta, transformational shaman. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Joshua Radawan. This is Mystical Mondays. And today we're going to talk about hacking the matrix, discovering the cheat codes for life. This was your idea, Josh. So you want to talk about what that is for, for a minute? Yeah, this is exciting. So I, I have to say, I had just recently watched the new matrix movie and, you know, Neo is one of the best hackers uh, out there, you know, like he learned how to you know, step into the fullest expression of his real self. So how does that apply in the real world? And I sat with that for a while. Like, how is it that I was able to elevate myself? How is it that the people that I've, I've worked with seem to elevate themselves? And it, it reminded me of something that I, I came, I stumbled across about three years ago, and that was the universal laws and how we can use them in order to create the life we want and to understand how the universe operates. So by understanding how the universe operates, we can learn to work with it in that flow state. So, you know, the, the first law I want to talk about was the law of attraction. And, you know, I think you've written whole courses on this. So who better I to have. talk about it than? <laughs> <laughs> well, so the law of attraction, so just in, if you're, you know, in your information gathering phase, the law of attraction was first referenced by the entity Abraham channeling through Esther Hicks. And so if you look up Abraham slash Hicks, you can find out a lot about the law of attraction. He talks about it incessantly and she's been channeling him for decades. I, I, I first heard about them in like the late seventies, early eighties. The law of attraction is basically the process of putting into the universe that which you desire as an intention and then calling it to you and resonating with it in, in harmony with it, such that it will come into you and be part of you. And so, you know, people talk a lot about the visualization piece and, you know, they say, oh, well, you feel it with motion and all this other stuff, but it, it's, it's great. But the, the piece that's, that most people miss is the being piece and the receiving piece, right? Because I, this I see all the time. People will use the law of attraction. They will manifest something amazing and then they will never try and manifest anything ever again because they get freaked out, right? They're like, oh my God, I did that. Oh, that can't be, no, no. Okay, I'm just gonna run away now, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's hysterical. I watch it happen all the time and it's just this, this proof that they have power in their own lives and then they're just like that's more responsibility more power than i i want to know about right so that sort of thing so the law of attraction is about manifesting yeah well i'll say that that makes a lot of sense you know the the teachings of abraham i have always been one of my favorite teachings as well since since i've started on the path that she was also one of the first ones that that came to me so yeah that's that's awesome so another one of the laws that that showed up was the law of compensation like whatever you sow you will reap you know and is, is this like a karmic law would 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 you consider that like the law of karma um i think it's more less less karma and more consequence right it's it's what you put out is what you bring back it is you know garbage in garbage out like for computers right if you program the computer with garbage you will get garbage back out of it it's the same thing in our lives if we put garbage into our lives we will get garbage out of it uh if we put you know intention and positive thoughts and positive intentions and you know all of the actions you know right actions and things like that into our lives then all of the good things come flowing back out it's 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 more of a you know consequence than than karma karma the concept of karma is the idea that you know what we do comes back to us through lifetimes and yeah to a certain extent that is what we're looking at but this this law is more broad than that because it's what happens in this life too right so yeah yeah that that really kind of ties into the the law of inspired action as well you know you know like often we will you know, like use the law of attraction, right? This is the life I want. This is the thing I want. 
And then the universe is like, okay, well, here's how you get it. And you're like, well, no, that's, I just didn't, why isn't it at my doorstep right now? So, you know, that using that inspired action to actually, you know, follow the signs that the universe gives you to, you know, get what you want um, is, that's my definition of how inspired action works. Do you have something different on that? Well, so when we're trying to attract something, if we're doing the law of attraction, inspired action is part of that process in in the fact that we there's there's times when you feel inspired to do something it's like oh i just need to do this and you know it's the same thing with intention right you know you're you're creating your intention for your manifestation and you're like okay so i want to create a business that does x right okay well then you have to actually set up the business you have to set up the bank accounts you have to get your merchant account you have to get your ability to you know work in whatever format you're going to work whether that's in person or online or whatever there are different steps that you have to take in order to get that to happen and that is part of the manifestation process is you're taking the steps and with the assumption that it is happening, right? That, that And that's a key factor there, by the way, is the assumption that it's happening, right? And so the inspired action is in furtherance of the intention, but it's also sometimes just about feeling inspired to do something, right? It's, you know, we talk about this as intuition a lot and it's, it's you know, you just happen to, you know, I tell the story about, you know, I finished my, my oatmeal at Starbucks when I was in the airport and I had the brown sugar packet, which I never use. And I just threw it in my purse, not knowing why I put it in my purse instead of, you know, throwing it away or giving it back or whatever. And, and on the plane, somebody asked for brown sugar in their coffee and I just have to have it. That's an inspired action, right? It's like, oh, here you go. Right. That sort of thing is what we're talking about is in, in inspired action as well. So it can be both. Yeah, I want to come no. back to gratitude, though, because gratitude is super important. Um, gratitude is the if you're going to pick one law to practice and nothing else, gratitude would be it. OK, because gratitude is kind of like the highest pinnacle here. And that's the idea that you are already expressing gratitude for what you already have. And then you're expressing gratitude for that which you're bringing into being as though you already have it, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that today I have, even though you don't have it yet, right? But if you're in the practice of gratitude on a regular basis and you add a gratitude in that's a not yet, you know, you know, the, the way to get around the, the bullshit factor in your brain that says, I don't have this, I can't be grateful for it, <laughs> is to say, this is the eternal moment of now and even if it happens 50 years from now, I have it now because it is the internal moment of now. Even if it hasn't yet manifested into this current reality in this time space continuum, doesn't mean I don't have it yet. I have it already in the eternal moment of now. One of the my favorite things that you've taught me and is, is, is related to the law of attraction and, and gratitude. So I will, you know, practice both of, both of the, the laws in which you described right there. But the, the, the other piece is like, it's already here, right? Like I can see it. It's right around the corner. And I am so freaking grateful that the universe has provided. And I'm, I just, you know, like I'm, I can't wait to get this. I can feel it right now. And, and I cannot tell you how many times like that, what I was seeking just came right over the hill within a short amount of time. Depends on the manifestation too. You know, sometimes we have some bigger manifestations that take some time and also inspired action, which, you know, when we begin, I think we just expect the universe to drop a million bucks on, on top of our doorstep and, you know, but it doesn't happen like that. It might, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's right around the corner. Maybe that check's coming right now. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so the next law is vibration. This isn't one that I'm super familiar with. When we get into talking about the deeper level energetics and vibration and frequency, I will, I will, yeah, I know I can see you over there because I, I, I get the Charlie Brown wah, wah, wahs sometimes when you talk about it. And it, it's more of an understanding this for me. Like I have to experience it to understand it. And it's coming little by little, but can you, can you, you know, give us what you got? Because I know this is your bread and butter, girl. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you, you already do understand it. You just don't know it. You <laughs> said 
I feel the gratitude. I feel it's just coming over the corn, you know, over the hill, blah, blah, blah. Right. That's vibrating with the energy of the thing that you're creating. Okay. So the, our vibration is created through our energy field and our emotions really impact our vibration. Right. And so, you know, getting excited about it, getting anticipatory, you know, planning what you're going to do with it, you know, acting as if, right. All of these things are bringing your energy into vibrational harmony with that, which you are bringing to you, creating and attracting. And when you bring your beingness state, and that's what I was talking about with the law of attraction, this all interrelates, okay? <laughs> when you bring your beingness state, the, your vibration into alignment with the part, with the, the reality that you're choosing to create, suddenly it arrives so much faster because it is attracted to your vibration, which is, it's a general, that's actually one of the laws, uh, and I don't think we have it on here, but there is a law that it like attracts like, right? And so when we are vibrating with the energy of gratitude for this thing that we're bringing into form, it pulls it to us so much faster because gratitude says I already have it right? Gratitude says it's already here. Gratitude says I am the person who has this. And the beingness of the being the person who has this creates the having of it. And uh, so this is the vibrational piece. And, and so, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, I, this was the hardest thing for me to get over because I'm like reality girl, right? I had a very hard time stepping out of reality. And you know, I'm very, I'm very grounded. I'm like, this is what things are. Rah, rah, rah. It's very black and white. Right. But the, the fact is that, that what you see in front of you is the illusion. The reality is that you are this infinitely creative being having a physical experience and the physicality is limiting in time and space and, and you know what energy in terms of what can be created and how quickly compared to the quantum field right if we're up in the the astral the quantum field whatever you want to call it um everything comes into form immediately right but here on earth it takes a little bit longer because we're in physical reality and it has to have time to manifest in from through the archaeus which is the the manifestation point if there's a this is an alchemical term it's a you comes from energetic form into physical through the archaeus and so the you know as it comes into physical form it it is forming itself and it's forming itself through circumstance and situation and whatever and we often think oh well there's no way my life could change that quickly blah 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 well, you, okay you can believe that but the fact is that the universe is infinitely more resourceful than you are because it has so many more resources available, right? Yeah, it's like, I can't grow a single blade of grass out of nothing. The universe can, right? <laughs> so, you know, and how many billions and trillions and quadrillions of, of blades of grass are there on the planet? And a lot, right? And there's, there's that many more resources available to the universe than there are to us. So vibration is about bringing your energy into the space where you acknowledge the truth of the fact that if it exists on the planet, it can be yours, right? And that's, even if it doesn't exist yet, you could create it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wow. That actually, I think, was the first time I had an aha moment when you, when you talked about it directly. I, that that hit on so many levels. Wow. Uh, so I, I wanted to. So the next one I wanted to talk about was oneness the law of oneness and yeah. this i have to say was a concept i really struggled with in the beginning because like you i you know until i really dove deep into the path i black and white like how am i one with everything how am i one with this computer how am i one with this earth how am i one with everybody else how am i one with the universe because i am completely a separate consciousness so i would love to hear your take on this because i, I feel that oneness now because i see the reflections of myself and everything and everybody around me now. Um, but it took me a while to get there because of that black and white, you know, like this, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, yeah, if you want to share with us what, you know, your, your concept with that is. Well, if you ever wonder about oneness and whether or not it's true, all you have to look at is mob mentality. 
right? Mm. When, if you look at the, the psychological construct of a mob mentality, uh, you will see that there is an energy of one particular thing fueled by fear that is spun up through panic and energy. And suddenly the mob is, is ruling and nobody's minds are working individually anymore, right? That is a classic example of oneness coming and asserting itself through negative energies, obviously, but it is an example of oneness. And when I do my coaching and my group programs, you'll find, I know you've experienced this, where you know everybody cycles at the same time. They can be in eight different places in the program, but they're all going through the same stuff at the same time. And that is fairly common. And it, once you're in the energetic world of, of you know, people who are aware, you'll also see this with astrological cycles and things like that. And, and where everybody's feeling like they got run over by a Mack truck or everybody's feeling like they're exhausted or they're, they're overstimulated and crawling out of their skin and all of the things, right? And it's because there are universal things that are happening across the board and we are all being impacted by it. The, the cultural energy of the US when I left two years ago was just so toxic. I had to leave the energy. There was a, a, an energy of that space, right? And that wasn't my energy. It was the, it, the predominant energy of the country was like that. And so, you know, I, for my own health, I had to leave. I was just like, I, I have to be gone. And so, you know, that those are all examples of their, their microcosms of the macrocosm, right? So, you know, there's a, an energetic field of the U.S. That's the morphic field of the U.S. And that is a microcosm of the oneness field of the larger picture, right? And so when we talk to our guides, when we go up into the astral, when we tap into the, the, the matrix, right? When we tap into the <laughs> matrix, the, that energy is universal source energy that we can go into and tap into, right? We can make use of that in the prim primordial ooze to create in through chaos magic elements, right? There's lots of ways in which this stuff can be used, but the, you know, this is the way we connect to each other. It's, it's through these microcosms of our overlapping energy fields or, you know, through our, our ability to communicate em empathically and telepathically and things like that. Those are all created through the larger um, dimensional construct of this oneness that we are, right? We are everything and we are nothing, right? It is the balance of the both and, right? And this is why we see our insides reflected on the outside is because we are part of everything and everything is part of us. It's, it's yeah. not just reflected, it is. We are, we are it and it is us and we are all together. That is the oneness. It is not a reflection, it is a beingness. And because you're resonating with that particular beingness, that's what you see outside of you. It was the vibration. It was, it was, it was the law of oneness that really helped me to become, you know, a better human or want to be a better human. Because when I saw everyone as a reflection of myself, I began to stop judging them so harshly. Cause you know, like I, you know, like using the law of oneness and, and, you know, like the, the, the outer judgment um, was actually really a, a more, I, I'm not going to say it was harder than the inner judgment lessons, but uh, there was, you know, like understanding that we are all one, understanding that we are reflections of one another, and that we all have a, a journey that we're going through as part of the whole. And uh, it, it made me just look at the world in a whole different light. The next law I want to talk about, and this is this is one another one of your bread and butters, is gender. Uh, the law of gender. And, you know, what I mean by that is balancing the masculine and feminine energy within us. And, you know, I know that you were, you, you taught Tantra for a while. Is that correct, Kelly? I did. Yeah. I taught Tantra for a while, for a hot minute. <laughs> um, but mostly <laughs> what I'm, what I was teaching was the balancing of the masculine and feminine within, which is the idea that the, the masculine energy is the, the energy of great spirit. And if we're going to talk in native American terms, it's great spirit and great mystery, masculine and feminine, right? The, the, there is in 
Indian culture, it's the idea that the that there's a great spirit that not great they don't call it great spirit, but the idea that there is a spirit that is that part of us that survives from one life to another. And then there's that's the masculine spirit. And then the feminine spirit is that part of us that is embodied on the planet, right? And so in in Indian culture and in Hindu mythology, you had to have, I think it was six or seven, I think it was six, six masculine spirits and one feminine spirit in order to create the earth, right? That that's the indicator of the the importance of the feminine spirit in relation because seven being a magical number, obviously, but also the you can't the the masculine spirits could not create physical reality without that one feminine spirit. That was not possible. And so, you know, when we talk about this, what we're talking about is the masculine energy goes from the heart chakra up. It's that energy that most of us walk into when we first start in the spiritual work in the world. And that's the stripping away and, and the understanding, right? It's like, I got to understand and strip away all my limiting beliefs, all of my limiting assumptions, all of the things. And I strip away, strip away, strip away until I become nothing and I become one with everything, right? That's the masculine path to enlightenment. Now, a lot of it's, uh, you know, it's all in your head in a lot of cases, you know, you're doing meditations and you're grasping and understanding laws and all the stuff. That's why it's the path of light, right? Then there's the path of darkness, which is the feminine. So if you think yin yang, right, there's that, that light and the white and black, right, with a little dot of each of the other in it too. So you have to understand that that's, that's the reflection piece. That's that, that as within, so without thing, right? And so the feminine path is from the heart chakra down. It is in the darkness. It's great mystery. And the biggest mistake most people make when trying to transition from one to the other is that they come into the darkness and go looking for the light switch to try and understand it. There is no light switch in the darkness. There is just the darkness. You have to experience it. It is an embodied state, not a mind state, not a stripping away state. It is a and it is a beingness state of accepting and receiving, accepting and receiving without judgment, all that is until you accept and receive and become everything and become one with everything. And the balanced path of the both to come to enlightenment is to do both the masculine and the feminine at the same time and have it not be a paradox. So that is usually the advanced level, right? When, when people are, are <laughs> transitioning from beginner to advanced, they, they step into that embodied state and they start doing that work in the darkness and in the experiential phase, in the experiential perspective of the world. You stop thinking in duality terms when you step into that level of work. You start to step into the experiential level where you don't judge things as good or bad, but just as experiences. They just are an experience. So that's that's part of that whole construct. So yes, I talk about that a lot. <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> I can. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great segue into the next one. And that's uh, the law of relativity. And this is really came into play in shamanic studies. And to me, in my understanding of the law of relativity is that everything is relative, you know, like there are no coincidences. For me, I use this as, you know, you know, I, I spoke a little bit this in our first couple episodes, but I thought I was going nuts at the beginning of my spiritual journey because all of these synchronistic events started, you know, happening at once. And I didn't see them for what they were. I, I just thought I was going mad like Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind. That's what it what it felt like. But I didn't see it was a multitude of, you know, my higher self and other spirits and, you know, other people in this realm, you know, trying to communicate with me to get me on the right track. So, you know, the, that's, that's my perception of the, the law of relativity. Yeah. So the law of relativity is, is what you have to recognize. And this one I love because it, it, this is one of the reasons why I really encourage people to study mythology and metaphor and things like that, because the spirit world speaks to us in symbols. It does not often, you know, if, if you get good at talking to your guides, they'll sometimes talk to you in words, but more often they like to give you visuals or symbols that you work with because the symbols are more robust as a language. 
And so, you know, one image can carry eight or 15 different meanings, right? And so the, the reason that they speak in symbols is because there are layers of meaning that you get. And if you've ever read tarot cards, you know this, right? You'll, you'll see one layer of meaning and then you'll see a bunch of other symbols connected together in the cards and that'll be another layer of meaning and they'll, the, the meanings will apply to multiple different aspects of your life and, you know, all of that. So, you know, we, when it's so funny, if you're a tarot reader and you do a bunch of readings in a day for somebody, you're going to find that what happens is that you have one or two or three cards that come up in every, almost every reading. And those are your reading for you because there's the, that was the commonality that everybody had who came to you that day. And the reason that all those people came to you is because you were the common source, right? And so that's, you end up with a reading for yourself. And that's, that's sort of what I'm talking about with relativity is that every, every person we interact with, everything that happens, we have a relationship to, right? And we are, we are actually contributing to its existence through our existence because we are part of it and it is part of us, right? That's what relativity is. And so you can, when you start to see your life as a metaphor, when you start to see it as a, a mythological story, you can begin to, to really pull out the common themes that are happening throughout that story and begin to understand it at a deeper level. And when you start to study mythologies and, and stories and the hero's journey and all of that, then you can begin to look at that and inform yourself through the understanding of the archetypical journeys and the archetypical mythologies that you're engaging with these particular storylines, right? Because the there's these stories exist in the ethers. They exist in the in the archetype in, in the archetypal morphic fields. And we engage them through different processes that we participate in our in our lives. And so, you know, when we do that, that is where the law of relativity comes into play. And that's why, you know, this is really sort of advanced level shamanic stuff that I'm talking about right now. I mean, this is this is pretty far down the path, but this is why I encourage people to study all of these things because it, it informs it and it gives you a better vocabulary with your guides when you're learning to talk to them and all of the things. So yeah, there's that. Yeah, this is one of those episodes you're probably going to listen to 40 or 50 times to really try to grasp what, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I know I will, you know, like the, I, I go back and listen to these quite a bit just because it's, it's important to, uh, you know, to really anchor that into our, you know, like your beingness. Um, you know, the, yeah. the next law I want to talk about was cause and effect, cause and effect. Yeah. What are you see? What is your take one, on that one? <laughs> Yeah. So cause and effect is similar to the law of compensation that we've talked about before, which is, you know, what you create is what you will get back, right? It's, it's, there is, there is a cause, there's something that we do, and then there's an effect that is created from that. And we, you know, this is mostly about personal responsibility. Okay. This is about recognizing that your actions have consequences and owning your consequences. When you own the fact that you created something, you have power to change it. And this is the thing. So, you know, people talk all the time about, oh, you know, you're blaming the victim when you're saying that you create your own reality, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, I'm not blaming because blaming implies judgment. What I'm saying is that you participated in creating your reality in some way, shape or form. And when you can accept that you participated in creating that reality, then you can shift it. So long as your finger is pointing at the other person, you that's where your power goes to, right? So when you can take back responsibility for your life and say, so I'll give a classic example because this is one that people deal with all the time. My parents were terrible parents. They didn't take care of me. They should have done this. They should have done that, right? And you're pointing the finger. Now your parents have all the power to, and, and you're still trying to get them to do what they're clearly not going to do because if they were going to do it, they would have done it by now, right? So you're pointing the finger at them and now they have all the power over you to you know, control whether or not you ever get what you need. If instead you take that power back and you say, I didn't get what I needed as a child, instead of you didn't give it to me, it's I didn't get what I needed. Now it's, I didn't get what I needed. So now I'm in control 
of making sure that I can get what I need going forward. See the difference? That's Absolutely. Cause and effect. Okay. When we when we take on the responsibility, we take on the power to change it. You know, and I went through this in one of your classes recently. And it was funny because you know, I, in the last episode we had talked about you know business decisions that I had made that maybe weren't so fruitful. You know, and it was because you know, and I was blaming my business partners. I was like, "This is all shit," because you know, like uh, you guys. But the truth is, is I created it, you know, like I knew it was a bad idea. I had a bunch of qualms before I went in. And as, as it, you know, wasn't working out, I started pointing fingers like this isn't my fault. This is all, you know, like it's all not working. And it was through that law of, you know, through the cause and effect and recognizing that, Hey, I, I created this. I saw all the things before that this wasn't going to work. And I, I chose to disregard the law of, of cause and effect that I learned a valuable lesson, but you know, we also talk about being hard headed in this podcast and that's how I learned the best lessons yeah. sometimes. <laughs> Not that I'm manifesting yeah. that or attracting that. I am grateful for the lessons I've learned and ready for an easy up path. The next one we're going to talk about and you know, coming, this is a, another great one for the transformational shaman and, you know, queen of energy work is perpetual transmutation of energy. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, so this is the same thing as saying the only thing that's constant is change, right? Change is the only constant in the world. And that's because things are constantly coming into form and going away. And that is just the nature of physical reality, right? By the nature of the fact that we are mortal, all relationships will end, right? By the nature of the fact that, that this is a physical reality, things are born and things die. That is just the nature of the thing, of the space that we are operating in here. And so per, 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 perpetual, yeah, I can say transmutation of energy <laughs> is just the, the statement that energy is constantly changing forms. It is constantly shifting and, and moving. And the good news about that is that it, nothing is stuck. Anytime we feel like we're stuck, it's an illusion because energy is constantly transmuting, right? So if we're stuck, it's an illusion. It's, it's us being attached to some reality, right? And so, you know, that's the piece that we need to pay attention to, not, we, we often externalize our stuff, right? We'll be like, ah, it's all the outside world. It's all the outside world, right? But there's, there are things inside of us that need to get unstuck in order for us to move. But the energy is constantly shifting. So unless we really hold on tight to that thing that is keeping us stuck, eventually it's going to move because everything is moving. That's the, the law of transmutation of energy. I guess I have a little question in regards to that, you know, you know, some of the things that we see through the energy review process and, you know, some of the clients that, that come to us, we see people in that energetic fetal position. Would this be at one of the cases where there is a stuck energy or does it just mean that they're not taking in energy from a, another source? Is the energy in a transmutational process during that time? So the, the, Energetic fetal position is a state of being where you've cut yourself off from the, your root chakra and your, and your crown chakra from universal source and from earth energy. And it is a defensive state that is designed to be short term. It's, it's meant to be like 15 minutes where you're under attack. You go into your defensive ball and, and you protect yourself. And you're not allowing any energies in or out. And that way you are protected from what's going on around you. And that's, that's a protective state. The problem is, is that a lot of people get stuck in it. If they've lived in, in environments where they felt unsafe for long periods, they will just go into that state and, and stay in that state and they become energy vampires to try and refill their energy. Uh, they steal energy from other people because they are not connected to earth and sky, right? And so the when you're in that energetic fetal position, can you get stuck? Yeah, you can get stuck. It's a lot harder to move when you're having to steal your energy to, to replenish, especially if you still have the habit of giving away too much, which is often the case with the, the people who are in that state. Uh, and so, yeah, you can get pretty stuck because you, ha you have a dearth of energy. You never have enough, right? But is that inherently a stuck space? No, it is not inherently a stuck space. It's just a shutting off. So if you're doing it short term, it, it is not a stuck space at all. If you're doing it long-term, then yeah, it can be very much a stuck space. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, next law I wanted to look at was polarity. Law of polarity. Yeah. Is that the law of opposites? Well, yeah. Yeah. It, basically, it's the law of opposites. It's, it's, I, everything ties together in this, right? So if we go back to that beingness state of the law of attraction and the vibration state, right? Of being vibrating in a certain thing and that now you're pulling into you the other things that vibrate with you. But at the same time as you're going to pull things into you that vibrate similarly to you, you're going to repel things that are opposite vibrations. So if you're holding a very positive state and you're holding a lot of good energy, then the things that are negative are going to be repelled, right? And so, you know, that, that repelling can take a different forms, but, you know, for instance, I was, we were talking about, I was creating the podcast when we were doing a lot of the, the creation of the, the episodes here. And suddenly there's dogs showing up on the doorstep, like at unprecedented rates. We just had like all these dogs from the neighborhood come into the door and I'm like, oh, they're reacting to the energy of the podcast because the podcast is, you know, good, high, high vibration and dogs like high vibration and they're feeling the energy. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Right. So, but there's, you can see it reflected, even if it's not in the same place that you think it is. Right. That's, that's polarity. But at the same time, you know, negative things are being repelled and you won't see that as much because they're they're going away from you and so you're not interacting with them as much now once in a blue moon the the negative thing might have a rebellion response and those are your haters on your in, on the internet right so that that's the rebellion response of the of the things being repelled and so you know that's how that comes into play with polarity. But yeah, polarity is I pull to me that which I am resonating with and I push away from me that which I am not resonating with and that there are opposites. We're, we're, we're in a duality world. And so duality being, you know, opposites, right? And so polarity is part of that duality being this space. Um, when we step into the experiential space, this polarity piece becomes just about attracting and repelling and not as much about having the opposite balance. It just depends on where you are. Well, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. As usual, Kelly, that makes a lot of sense. The next law, we have a couple left here. We're going to we'll take a look at the law of rhythm. To me, you know, it's interesting. I was in a, a plant medicine ceremony when I was younger and you know, two things came to me during during that that ceremony was that drums and math held the keys to the universe, and uh, you know I was twenty two and I was like I have no idea what the fuck that means, <laughs> but it, you know as I've as I've begun to grow I do see the the connected with 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 the you know being in the shamanic studies and seeing you know, working with drums and understanding it's more than that. It's kind of that flow state of going with the rhythm of the universe. Um, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, the flow state is definitely the rhythm piece here. There, there is a rhythm flow an energy to the universe. And when you are working with the rhythm, with the flow, life goes easier. When you are trying to paddle upstream, you know, against the flow and against the rhythm, then life gets harder, right? Um, in, in a lot of pagan circles, there is a saying that drums call the people and bells call the gods. And so, you know, drums are a, there's a visceral experience of drumming. Drums send vibration through the body and they have their own impact in, in that way. I actually used to run a drum circle and I would teach new people how to drum that if they were having a hard time finding the rhythm. I would drum on their back. I would rhythm onto their back so that they could feel the rhythm in their body. And then, you know, the key to, to being able to drum effectively is to turning your brain off. You have to be embodied to drum effectively. If you're thinking about when the next beat is going to be, you're not going to be on the beat. You're going to be behind it. And so you have to get out of your head and into your body in order to be able to drum effectively, which is why children are so good at drumming when they, when they have a beat around them, they will just go right into it because they're not in their heads, right? Young children are very good at drumming in, in, very quickly because of that. And so, so being in the rhythm is very much about an embodied state. It's the, 
it's the reason why when there was the tsunami in Thailand years ago, that they found very few dead bodies of animals because all the animals felt that they needed to leave that space, right? They were in the rhythm of the energy of the space and the energy of the space went, mm, not good here, go. And they went, okay, and off they went, right? They didn't know that there was a tsunami coming. They just knew they didn't want to be there, right? It's just, that is it's the place where we humans are out of alignment most of the time, you know, because of, of everything that we've been brought into and being in our heads, you know, we've lost track of our bodies and the bodies are what tell us, I, I don't want to be here anymore. You know, I, I need to be somewhere else. And so that's how that happens. But you see it, I mean, especially with big events, you know, with things like people didn't get on the Titanic or people didn't show up for 9-11 to the Twin Towers that day. They were late. They were running behind. They decided they needed to do something else first. There was this, this was them listening to their visceral response. Their body knew they're, they're, we're always living in the eternal moment of now, right? So part of them knew this was going to happen. And so they were out of the building because they knew and they trusted their bodies and they, you know, whatever showed up was engaged because part of them knew and knew that they weren't meant to die in that building that day. Right. So, you know, that's the same reason why so many people didn't sail on the Titanic. So they, they knew at some level, right. That happens with every major problem. Yeah. I, I really like what you said about the drum circle. I, you know, me and Cassie host drum circles here and we've, we've ran into that where people have a hard time following and finding the rhythm. Never thought once to allow that vibration to run through the body or to, to you know, help them tune in in that way. So that's a, that's an amazing tip. And, you know, as, as you know, I would say intermediate musician, when I think about what I'm doing, it it's garbled garbage when i when i just yes. let go and just find that flow i'm like oh what was that? i'll listen back i was like what was that you know like what you know what, what was that because i'm out of my head and just in the moment in the eternal moment of now you know the last law we're going to look at is the law of correspondence and i have to be fully honest here i don't know what that means because i don't remember this law so I, i'm gonna have to go back and look at this one myself <laughs> so it's been a long time since I've looked at these myself, but I, I'm pretty sure I know what this one is. So correspondence is that it it's very similar. And I'm, I, you know, why don't you go look it up and make sure that we've got it right while I'm having this conversation, because I could be wrong. I haven't looked at this one recently, but in my mind, correspondence means that what we see is a reflection of what we believe. and you know, the, the best way to recognize this particular one is to say, hey, you know, I, I'm thinking about buying this new Toyota Prius or whatever, right? We're going to use that as an example. I'm going to buy a Toyota Prius. Okay. So now everywhere I go, all I see are Toyota Priuses, right? And so the, the Toyota Prius becomes visible but it's, you're seeing them everywhere, but they've always been there, right? You just didn't notice them. Your filters changed. And now what you see is what you're looking for, what you're paying attention to. And so now it's popping out of the background. There, there are a million billion different inputs that we experience every day and we can't pay attention to them all. There's just not enough bandwidth in our brain to do it. And so correspondence talks about being able to shift your filters. So your filters are what you, what you focus on is what you, what you see, right? It's that what you expect to see, what you believe, what your assumptions are. Those are all things that are coming back. And I think that's what that law is. If it's not, then it's something else, but yeah. there's always so many different takes on these from different people as well. Know. You know, a couple of what ones is, what that are, the, what does the internet say? Oh well, yeah, let's 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 go to the internets. So the, the internet. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, a couple that are resonating here. The it simply states that you are telling the universe how to communicate with you. Maybe this you know yes. can go hand in hand with building That's your symbolic library. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. what happens around us is a direct reflection of what is happening within us. So. Yes, which is what I was just talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's it's <laughs> about to you know the ability to change your filters. It's the ability to recognize that that we are resonating with 
a, a beingness state and that beingness state creates the reality around us. Right. And so that, that, that's why we see what's reflected outside of us is because it is part of our beingness state, right? So all of these things interrelate. So if it sounds like I've said the same thing about eight times, it's because I have, because they're all interrelated. It's just different angles from which to come at the, the understanding. And when you put all of these pieces together, they form a larger picture, which allows you to actually hack the matrix, which is what we've been talking about today. So Absolutely. that's it for today. And we, we will talk to you next time. So make sure to tune in. We've got four more days worth of podcasts and, and do us a favor, rate and subscribe and share because we want to get the message out to as many people as possible. And remember, what you focus on expands. What you intend is what you create. So choose wisely. Have a great one. So that's it for today's episode of Spirit Guides Podcast. Head on over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen and subscribe to the show. Every week, one lucky listener who subscribes and posts a review on iTunes will be entered into a drawing for a $10,000 value grand prize and a private reading with Kelly Sparta herself. Be sure to head on over to spiritguidespodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Kelly's gift and join us on the next episode. Oh, 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 o